Hello, welcome to this cablecast of impact in the framework of Ars Electronica. Uh, we have several programs um, that are part of Ars Electronica and one of them is uh, this presentation related to the exhibition that is at the moment on display at Impact Center for Media Culture in Utrecht. The exhibition Abducting Europa uh, looks at the rise of populism and political extremism and how this is related uh, to uh, references of mythology, um, references to often misrepresented or simplified versions of collective history, and also how youth movements, online subcultures, uh, are related to um, these, the rise of, this moment, of these movements, uh, like for instance alt-right, and how the imagery uh, of these movements kind of supports extremism in political dialogues. Um, the exhibition downstairs has uh, a lot of artists um, and several of the artists represented in this exhibition will speak uh, in this documentary that you're going to see. They will speak about their work, they will introduce the works that we have in the exhibition, but they're also responding to several key questions that we're asking them, that we ask them uh, on the topics of our exhibition. So uh, please enjoy and watch this about 60 minute documentary on abducting Europa. My video is made entirely of the text of Polish internet memes about people from Ukraine, which appeared under the hashtags like typical Ukrainian, monkey Ukrainian, the Ukrainian won't be my brother. And in recent years, Polish forums and Polish whole internet have been filled with these countless memes about two monkeys. One of them is Provost's monkey, the long-nosed monkey, and the other is bald Wakari. And proboscis monkey is a disappearing species living in Borneo, and uh, it has been the hero of the countless memes in which it appears as a typical pole. And bald Wakari, the and bald Wakari is a small monkey living in Amazon forest which, as a meme, has been transformed into this typical Ukrainian. And its blood raised face has become the face of a stereotype that it's really lively in Poland, the stereotype of constantly drunk Ukrainian. Mm. And when I was collecting materials for this project over a year ago, I remember an article that appeared briefly in the, I think in the beginning of the 2019, and its headline read um, in different versions, but it was always very similar. A Ukrainian want, um, a Ukrainian was walking backwards across the Polish border, mm -hmm. and this sentence, this article was about an illegal immigrant who tried to cross the green border between Ukraine and Poland, walking backwards, so that the footprints of his shoes would indicate that the, he was going from Poland to Ukraine, not from Ukraine to Poland. So I decided that the story about the Polish border, which is also, of course, uh, the story about the border of the European Union, of the European Union would become this visual representation of the collection of these internet memes that I've put together in the video. And it would in some way enable us to think uh, and to reflect on those two directions of walking, of traveling, of East and West.
Um, I think the most important part of me thinking and what Europe means to me right now is that I think it kind of, kind of gives me this idea or this feeling of security in a way because I am a part of LGBT community in Poland and those last two years in Poland has been extremely difficult for us and the life just became more and more difficult and um, and thus this idea of European Union and Europe uh, is something that I think it's kind of very important for me, for me and this concept of human rights, this Western concept of human rights, it's also something that is very important to me on just a personal level and it's in for and I think it's kind of important for me to have this feeling of security that of security that comes with being part of European Union. Well, Europe means a lot of things. Um, it's uh, mixed feelings. On one hand, it means the fact that I've been living in Europe for, for most of my time and, and not only from my native country, Sweden, but I moved to Berlin uh, after I graduated in 2000. And, and, and I could move <laughs> to Berlin because of Europe or because of the European Union, that it was pretty easy to move around and, and not seek visas to, to work. And I lived also in the US for many years, so I know the process of applying for visas, etc. So it means flexibility, of course, and, and move, freedom of movement. But then I'm also, of course, very aware of that it means only that for uh, certain people, right? Well, it's a place to live. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an area that occupies Earth that I live in. Um, I mean, it's home. Yeah. But I don't, I'm not, um, I'm neither against Europe or for Europe. I have a very neutral stance. I've lived in a lot of different countries uh, growing up. I've been to like 14 different schools. So for me, I don't really have this like connection to any country or even any region in particular. I think Europe is many things to me. Um, it's where I live. I live in Germany, which is a part of Europe. I guess it's a, you know, a, a political zone um, that I, yeah, my, I guess I formally reside within um, and that it's an idea in which I enact my daily life. Um, and I guess it's also to me very much the European Union. Um, so it's a political body of various different kinds. So I live within Germany, within the EU, um, but also within Schengen zone. So I guess it's, a, it's an administrative space as well um, and, and, uh, and expression of a certain collective nationhood, supposedly. Um, but I guess it also is, has a cultural implication, especially for somebody who grew up in New Zealand, um, there is uh, I guess a particular idea of what Europeanness is from a New Zealand perspective um, and from various different um, cultures and actors within New Zealand. Um, so uh, I, my, my, I guess, um, family line uh, can be connected to um, a wave of uh, migration from um, Europe to, uh, from, yeah, from Europe to New Zealand, from Britain um, at the time. Um, and in the 19th century. Um, and that's a very ambivalent thing uh, for me. Obviously, it's where I come from culturally in some ways, but I also see all of the difficulties that colonialism brings to New Zealand and to the world. So um, Europe as a cultural and political space is, um, yeah, full of lots of challenges that I have a difficult time resolving myself. Um, I see some of the effects of uh, colonialism and um, European ways of, uh, I guess, um, acting in business and in governance that I would push back on and that I um, would like to see changed. So 
Europe as an idea is also um, full of many things to question. I might need to think a lot about uh, what it really means to me. I think, first of all, it means uh, the enlightenment. I think that's the most important thing which connects me to, to, uh, to Europe. On the other hand, it might have something to do in my mind with uh, the idea of uh, modernism, which um, I would say was born in Europe. Um, it might have to do with the, with the notion of progression, um, so maybe these three, and in spite of the fact that I, um, yeah, I'm, to some extent uh, I, I might be critical with, uh, with the progression and uh, even to some extent with the modernism, if, if we think about the Second World War and uh, even the Holocaust, it is somehow, <clears throat> um, it might be connected to, uh, to the modernism. Um, I think that these all, all, all three are quite important for me and uh, on the other hand what I really um, appreciate in, uh, in Europe is the, um, uh, is the individual, I wouldn't say freedom, but maybe self-determination which I think is more or less a, a, a European value <clears throat> since the French Revolution. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for sure, Europe also means colonialism and uh, I think that the, the issue of colonialism, it is a very important political issue right now uh, in the <clears throat> from the perspective of the division of let's say uh, Western um, uh, and part of the Europe and let's say Eastern part of the Europe. Uh, <clears throat> and it's been even part of the, uh, it is even part of the official political rhetorics in Hungary, this reference to the colonial past of Europe, which actually like Viktor Orban, for instance, doesn't want to share. So when in 2015 the, the refugee crisis uh, took place and we had uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees crossing Hungary and there were these huge debates about uh, what Hungary should do, uh, uh, Viktor Orban somehow uh, let everyone know that he considers this migration crisis uh, uh, as being a result of the colonialism and as Hungary and these countries on the east, they didn't have anything to do with the colonialism, therefore it's not our problem, so Western, uh, Western Europe should somehow solve these. For me, what is the most interesting part of Europe, if we think of Europe as part of the European Union, is not Europe, but the Union. I'm interested in this question, what does unionization mean? And what does unionization mean, not in the traditional sense, not necessarily in the trad traditional sense of the labor union that has a particular, that has that relates of also to a limited scale of, of membership. I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of what this model of unionization could mean on a transnational or on a planetary scale. Uh, what does it mean to build unions, not only based on, um, on cultural categories, but on principles of transnational solidarity, redistribution, colonial reparation. Um, and I feel that um, although the European Union has been deeply corrupted through its austerity doctrines on one hand and through its uh, growing uh, nationalist and racist tendencies on the other, I feel that in that promise, in that idea of, of unionization lies a fundamental uh, lies a fundamental opening towards towards the future in a time in which we are dealing with crises that um, that reach far and far far beyond uh, the traditional model of the of the nation state. We need to somehow be able to think on a planetary level without losing sense of what our place specific site specific place in the world is. Every one of us has a place based understanding of the world and and related to that place-based understanding are our ties to communities, to language, to cultural trajectories. These are extremely important, but I don't think these are the categories based on which um, a transnational unionization would, would necessarily uh, build. I think a transnational union should function as, as in recognition of cultural specificity, in recognition of cultural history, should not uh, attempt to to mimic the kind of globalist um, atomization and, and uh, um, 
generic implementation of uh, of capitalist culture uh, across the world. It should recognize uh, these these specificities and at the same time solidarize on like acts in a solidary manner uh, on the on on those questions that concern our common the com our common possibility for some form of meaningful survival considering uh, the the ecological catastrophe that we are already finding ourselves in the in the in the middle of So this work of mine is called Europe and uh, it was recorded in 2012 uh, in an island in Greece called Anafi and I was invited with a group of international artists and dancers and curators and thinkers and writers to all gather at this island for two weeks where we would somehow reflect about the political situation or the uh, crisis in, in Europe. And uh, Greece was in an economic crisis then. And, uh, and we were basically reflecting about ways out and, and how, could we, how could we rethink or how could we uh, work together and how could, how, what is the future of art and artists working together. And, this was also tied to a magazine called South Magazine, which later became the Documenta magazine. So, uh, and that issue was called Arcadia. So that was sort of the whole topic. And so I didn't know before I went there what I would do. So I brought, as I work mostly with moving images, I brought my camera and a few microphones and I was, and the video that you see is very spontaneously recorded. So. Uh, and how I usually work is that I, or have been working the last 10 years at least, uh, or more even, is uh, that I uh, work in a very observational mode and I document things, but then the documented footage is to put together in a rhythmical montage. And I'm very interested also in the choreography and how images are working together. So uh, it's, I, I wouldn't call it a, a documentary uh, because it is also very much a subjective point of view from from me no <laughs> i feel just um, that it's um, it's something that grows out of fear and the fear out of the other and uh, maybe lack of knowledge that the other that you're part of the other <laughs> and uh, I just see uh, look on this whole nationalistic movement as a very sad repetition of of and just hoping that it will not have the same escalation and development as as any other destructive hate for the other The first, the first thought that came to my mind uh, is that it's not happening, that it's not possible. But I think that that is the answer that comes from emotion and not from like logic or something that will become analytical in my in my experience in my work. But I think I'm not really. I, I think it would be very hard for me to answer this question from the level of analytical question of like art question because because I'm every day I'm living in this national concept and this national of this of nationals happening every day and getting stronger and I I know what's the price. I know how it will, how it will, how this group, um, and I and I and, and I know what's the price. I know there are some many groups of people that are need to be left over, that are that need to be just left behind for this concept to be growing, and it just so hardcore sometimes, like so hardcore, so aggressive, that. 
no, I might think my answer is no, like a really strong no. I think uh, group narrative is important uh, and it's important to have stories. Stories are important, stories that bond us to one another. Um, and for example, mythologies, like myths always point out similarities like within the human condition, they're quite cathartic. Uh, but I don't think it has to be nationalistic. It can be humanist. Um, you can create stories that are not tied to a specific region, but are tied to the general human condition which exists regardless of one's cultural backgrounds. Like wanting to be loved, uh, avoiding pain, uh, you know, wanting to be appreciated and so on. This is something that, you know, is universal. Well, on the psychological level, for sure, because whoever believes in them, uh, it is he or she feels redeemed through it, uh, because it just strengthens the the identity narrative. Um, otherwise, I believe that the nationalism uh, it is pretty much outdated in a, in a, such an interconnected uh, world that we are living now. And especially in Europe, where, like on a very small territory, many many uh, peoples are living, and many countries are not nation states. Some of them are, so I don't believe that the nationalism uh, can be redeeming for either Europe or uh, any of the nations which tries to separate themselves. So if it's a separatist one, I I, I fully disagree with it. In terms of nationalism, I think nationalism as a term always always references a to a regressive, mythical return to um, pasts that generally never existed in the in the first place and that are then projected as our common futures. But the nation, the idea of the nation as something that describes a cultural category, of course, most certainly exists. And if we're thinking of new forms of planetary governance, these should not sidestep. Um, these cultural specificities, they should recognize, um, protect, and defend them. Hi, uh, my name is Simon Dinney, and um, I'm an artist uh, who was born and grew up in New Zealand, but I live in Berlin, in Germany. Um, and the artwork I have on display here um, is uh, called uh, Ascent Above the Nation State Rule Sets. Um, and it comes from a body of work that I made in 2017 um, for an exhibition in New Zealand, uh, in Auckland, where I grew up, about the changing nature of um, the way New Zealand was being framed politically by, um, I guess, a set of uh, international actors um, that are involved in technology businesses. Um, and trying to contrast their uh, to contrast and map their ideological point of view um, with uh, other points of view of seeing how to see New Zealand um, and how to see global politics at the time. Um, so uh, all of these works were that I produced for this series. Uh, the Founders Paradox was the name of the series. Uh, were based on board games. Um, and I made uh, sculptures which were display versions of these board games. And Ascent Above the Nation State was such a board game. And that sculpture is depicted actually in these canvases, these canvas prints. Um, but essentially it's a, uh, it's a, it's a kind of blow up of a, of a fictional rule set of, a, of, of this board game, Ascent. And um, the game is based on an existing game actually called Descent, um, quite a popular uh, board game, contemporary board game uh, that was uh, made in the last few years. But I kind of changed the narrative to show um, and emphasize, I guess, uh, the politics of some of the actors I was looking at. Um, and uh, this particular game was also a bit of a collaboration. I also collaborated with a writer um, and we were doing research on I guess the language around particular entrepreneurs um, and how they were framing their politics vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, the globe, but also, I guess, with a view to New Zealand, um, because uh, it kind of started with uh, the the founder of, or the co-founder of PayPal, Peter Thiel, uh, when he was in the media in New Zealand um, for, because he had property. 
there. Um, and there was a lot of speculation as to why he was interested in New Zealand and a lot of discussion, public discussion about um, who he was and what he does. Um, and uh, I thought this was of particular geopolitical importance um, to New Zealand and New Zealand culture. Um, and this is why I made these artworks. So this work is uh, looking to, I guess, illustrate and unpack a little bit the culture around some of the political positions that The piece you see here, it is entitled From Fake Mountains to Fate, uh, and it is a research-based uh, docufiction, which I produced in 2016. And actually, it, uh, uh, it is a critical analysis of, uh, uh, of, the Hungari of, of three of the major elements of the Hungarian state uh, ideology called uh, illiberal democracy. Uh, on one hand, it is about the symbolism of the ethnic landscape and political geography. That's uh, the video on the left, which is entitled uh, Amor's Geography. The second one, it is about the romantic uh, historicism, uh, historiography uh, of, of national myths of origin. That's the video on the right, which is entitled uh, uh, <clears throat> The Rise of the Fallen Feather. And then in the middle, you see uh, an installation, which is a, a kind of a pseudo museum uh, of, a, uh, of a fictitious uh, archaeological find. And this one speaks mostly about uh, Turanism as a re-emerging form of uh, political religion. Uh, initially, the, the piece uh, it is uh, more extensive, so instead of three vitrines, which you see here um, in the initial one, there are 12 uh, vitrines altogether, uh, denoted by certain categories. In this case, you see the category of memory and exclusion, uh, <clears throat> relics and uh, ideology, which, is the, which are the, the last three uh, chapters, actually, of, uh, of this part of the, uh, of the trilogy. And um, I think altogether the piece uh, uh, has carries many references to the show Abducting Europe, uh, because uh, <clears throat> besides some specific Hungarian issues, which I consider though as uh, case studies, so uh, therefore uh, <clears throat> starting from 2010, uh, the developments that took place in Hungary actually seemingly spread all around the world. So um, in, in, in this particular case, uh, uh, I also discuss uh, uh, issues related to uh, tribal identity, to the militarization of the education and uh, to, to how the mythical uh, tales and the mythical narratives uh, <clears throat> actually construct uh, the basis for uh, the national identity. And actually what I'm doing with this piece, it is that I'm creating a counter narrative to the, let's say, uh, official uh, narrative of the actual Hungarian state. Uh, it depends on their usage. Um, I think that uh, in the majority of the cases it is a reactionary thing um, for the same reason I already mentioned that uh, because they all refer to a kind of, uh, in fact, non-existent golden age. So all the mythical renderings are trying to formulate that golden age and that golden age in itself, it's, a, it's an exclusivist nationalist uh, position. So I, um, I, I couldn't really um, see any, let's say, sort of um, positive uh, usage of, uh, of mythological references, uh, again, in, in the contemporary uh, uh, situations. For sure, it can be within a cultural debate or whatever. I think it makes a lot of sense, but not in the political uh, uh, discourses, I believe. Coming from New Zealand, I'm aware of 
many different ways of understanding what a myth is um, from different cultural standpoints. Um, so, uh, you know, again, on the one side, I think from New Zealand, one um, uh, is very familiar, I think, also in the rest of the world with the way that New Zealand has been marketed as some kind of version of the Lord of the Rings, which has a kind of mythical, ancient, uh, like, basis to it, this kind of Tolkien, uh, British uh, fan fantasy space, which has been very strongly articulated and even marketed alongside New Zealand identity. Um, I think that is very, uh, that is full of problems. Um, I think that especially as uh, the history of colonialism is uh, so um, important to the way that uh, New Zealand functions and the way it's framed um, and all sorts of other things that go with that, um, uh, relying on these kind of European um, uh, myths and fantasies um, uh, are, um, yeah, don't include uh, many, many stories that are core to New Zealand and, and they tend to obscure uh, the the violence and um, and certain cultures altogether in their representation of that space. So I think that is really something to be problematic. Yet uh, within my understanding of, for example, Maori culture, Indigenous New Zealand culture, there are I guess many forms of what might be referred to as like myths um, and uh, certainly um, stories, collective stories that are told about beings which are non-human and um, and a kind of a um, are outside of uh, individual experience. And those, uh, as far as I understand it, can tell um, very positive stories um, for those who uh, they address. And indeed, um, collective storytelling is a big part of something that I see as very um, amazing in my understanding of what, uh, uh, for example, indigenous Maori culture is. So I guess, yeah, it's very, it depends on where you're standing on the, um, on the cultural spectrum, but I think generally, um, Western uh, European myths in New Zealand are very suspiciously questioned, um, I would say. I think what's interesting to me about myths is how little they have changed over time. Uh, like, for example, like the monomyth, the hero journey, and so on. Uh, they, they, these are still narratives that form um, the backbone of a lot of Hollywood uh, films. Um, I think, and also, also in art house films, like you have a lot of references to uh, Oedipus, like a lot of f films that are inspired by Freud, who was also then inspired by you know ancient Greek myths. So I think it can be progressive because there's a lot of progressive art house cinema that is based on these myths. Um, but I would say it's it's more like referential. Um, but of course, like in the context of art, right. Uh, those myths are used very differently. I mean, that's a, an extremely interesting question because, of course, let's say the Make America Great Again slogan, the Trump is slogan that, that mimics um, all of its variants, whether it is Modi in India or Duterte in the Philippines or Bolsonaro in Brazil, this, this um, mythological reconstruction of a great past that never existed in the first place, which is then projected as our common future, this is something that we see very strongly tied to reactionary, nationalist, racist, sexist, and homophobic forms of, uh, of politics today, because it tends to reach back to a kind of original unity um, uh, often uh, from a colonizer's uh, from a colonizer's perspective, so it also claims a kind of white indigeneity that never existed in the in the first place. These these are of course deeply flawed and problematic. But but myth and storytelling is of course always part of um, it's also part of of more progressive or emancipatory forms of of politics, and it touches very strongly on the on the role of art and culture in mobilizing our common imagine common imagination um w when we are fighting for alternate futures i mean these are somehow also myths they are not there they are stories that we tell each other stories that mobilize that agitate that trigger our desire to act and change the world that we live in but uh, whether our acting in the world that we live in has anything to do with the world we say we want to realize all of this remains one big open question and an experiment. So there's there in that sense. There's also myth. There's myth making. There's storytelling, and these myths and stories are as real as we desire to act upon them. So in in that sense, I wouldn't I wouldn't discard myth um, so easily. 
Yeah, no, I, I think they can indeed help. I, I think that if we embrace uh, the fact that part of most of our reality is based on myths or the myth of the other and the myth of ourselves, we can maybe also uh, make use of, of, of fiction and myths and, and ancient myths of, 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 of fine, um, uh, yeah, in, in, in order to, to look at yeah ways out uh, for uh, we could see this now with the corona crisis right nobody thought that the machinery could stop and suddenly it stopped and i think that it's important to sometimes use myths or fictions to reinvent uh, new ways of, of living God I Just Want to Feel is an installation created specifically for impact and it's a combination of three works. Dear God I Just Want to Feel, A Rose is a Rose and You Are All I See. Together they uh, form an altarpiece to the imaginary. Um, they all deal with topics of fantasy. Um, for example, You Are All I See is a visual diary that plays out a love story between a voluntary celibate man and a string of fantasy women. Um, the images, together, they depict loneliness, isolation, and maladaptive daydreaming found within various online communities of men who prefer the company of fictional characters over real flesh-and-blood girlfriends. Um, it's not... the images are not focused on any specific fantasy or any specific woman uh, or specific man, but rather they're together an ode to the salience of the could-be. The images are surreal and grimy, with collage layers that are peeling back to reveal failed, kitschy utopias uh, that are hints of the real world. Um, the images actually, despite looking very uh, 3D generated, are not. The, the three photographs are um, very little retouching work has been done. They are photographs of real sets that I have built. Um, and. Um, the, the, the works um, are a result of a, a voyeur surveilling other voyeurs. Uh, it is a woman, me, looking at men, looking at fantastical representations of other women. Um, there's a lot of mistrust um, and uh, people are no longer uh, trusting any kind of institutions, whether they're cultural or, or if they're political. Um, but at the same time, what, what I think is interesting is that there's still a lot of naivety left. So you don't trust uh, the, you don't trust doctors, you don't trust the scientific establishment or the political establishment, but yet you're still naive enough to believe what a stranger says on the internet that doesn't have uh, followers. Um, so it's a weird combination of cynicism, disillusionment and complete naivety. I think I just see it in the one hand, I see it as this, like, self-reinforcing loop that is happening like this consent from the people in power consent to emotions that that increase these emotions in society and which makes the people in power even more sure that then can fool them like they can tell them even more strongly or aggressively so i think yeah i think i think i think i see this as a kind of loop that is happening all over again and um, but also there's but i'm not sure i i'm not sure if that's even the right or correct question but that's something that i notice from many people in poland that this feeling um that this feeling that um, the nation is getting aggressive, is getting much more aggressive and violent, and the politics are getting more aggressive and more violent, is making, is making them just lose interest 
is just making them withdraw to some places of personal uh, personal happiness happiness or personal personal space in a way and just make them resign from the particip participation at all and that's something that is very scary for me and um, and I think it's even more scary because I actually was not for the last five years or the last like maybe eight years I was not only active in artistic community and making art itself but I was also active in activist community and I see how much it gets tired how much I get tired it gets tiring a lot and it just makes you like don't have yeah and in, in, in and it just makes you just don't have enough space in your body in your brain in your heart for it anymore sometimes and i think i know it do, does it to me sometimes and i'm pretty sure that it does it to a lot of younger generation in poland The easy response, in a way, is, is people that reflect on the, the ties between contemporary youth culture and technology. Um, but, but this, I think, but there's nothing new about that, because every generation has, has, that has grown up in, with a different set of, of, of techniques, of technologies, um, and adapted their sensory mode and understanding of the world, their computation of the world, through those tools. And that these tools develop doesn't doesn't make anything different about every generation readapting and reintegrating these uh, into their own uh, into their own sensual sensor, sensual modus operandi. What I would say is is very important in, in terms of our of current youth movements is the are the environmental concerns is the environmental mobilizations the Fridays for Future and many other uh, youth activist uh, uh, movements because they are. A generation that is marked um, by a great dying, by a great loss, a generation that be is becoming aware of what was and what they will no longer be able, um, that they, they will be no, no longer be able to, to witness. So in that sense, it's also a, a, gen a generation that goes through a great um, trauma that doesn't live the luxuries uh, of, our, um, of our pasts, which however complicated that they might have been, uh, still projected a, a kind of more or less durable um, idea of a future, of a future that, that would stably be waiting uh, for us. And of course, now we are dealing with a generation whose very idea of the future has, has, uh, has been undone. Uh, it's a, a, and, and what does it mean to be a futureless generation? In, in, at this moment, we see that it, um, it leads to, to great activism and mobilization in an attempt to create uh, conditions for some kind of um, social or just futurity to exist or to remain uh, and that is the great this is the great struggle of our time will we will we live in a world with a future history uh, or or not i think there's many youth cultures so or what young people are interested in which is constantly changing and evolving in both of those spaces, so the space where I live and the space where I'm from. Um, and, but I do see, of course, um, uh, like certain subcultures which relate to the work that I'm showing at Impact. Um, so uh, there are uh, many subcultures which proliferate internationally, both in Germany and in New Zealand online, and some are to do with articulating, yeah, writing fantasies about the world and what that looks like. And um, so I guess, um, you know, I certainly interfaced in my research uh, with spaces like 4chan and, um, and other online chat systems, which are kind of well known for um, being uh, breeding grounds for often quite young people to project onto these kinds of stories and ideologies. Um, so I guess that would be one thing that's relevant to me in, uh, in the space of what young people are interested in, both in kind of more local regional communities, which are then networked to uh, local and regional communities around um, in other parts of the world.
In Hungary, the youth culture, uh, I would say it is very much fragmented. And uh, I, I have the feeling as I'm kind of also teaching as, a, um, uh, as an as uh, associate professor, so I'm, I'm in touch with many generations. I have the feeling that the, the generation, the new generations, the youth actually today, it is uh, apolitic. So uh, <clears throat> they have various cultural preferences, but, but um, what unites them is that they are apolitic. This might also have to do with the late socialism in, 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 in Hungary. So in, in Hungary, you wouldn't find any movement, youth movement, as you find, let's say, in Russia, like the Nashi movement or, uh, <clears throat> or the identitarian movement all around Europe, for instance. It doesn't really exist in Hungary. So I think um, from this point of view, Hungary might be an exception. All around Europe, if I'm kind of uh, taking a closer look, actually maybe the identitarian movement is the, 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 the strongest nowadays. There are for sure everywhere local differences. In, in Germany, I think uh, uh, like the tradition of, of, uh, of Nazism is very strong. So you have a neo-Nazi, uh, very strong uh, uh, actual neo-Nazi, I wouldn't even call it subculture. Um, you have the lipster culture, which I don't know if you are familiar with the term. It's like the combination of, uh, of hipster and Nazi, which is the kind of the new right uh, uh, kind of thing. But you have at the same time uh, a very strong Antifa movement, uh, which I had the experience, uh, I, I had the chance to experience a few years ago. I spent longer time there. So it is, it is various, but all of, I, I would say across Europe, uh, maybe the, the identitarian movement uh, seems to be the, the strongest. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very kind of suspicious and doubtful about that. Um, but I think that's, the, that's one of the strongest uh, kind of youth culture which can be called as a movement. So this work is titled New Unions. New Unions is an artistic and political campaign that I started in 2016, um, beginning as a critique on the so-called Brexit dichotomy, the idea that the future of the European Union can only be defined through the so-called leave and remain campaign. And to me, it seemed there was some, something fundamentally wrong about this, um, this dichotomy, that on one hand, uh, the leave campaign uh, the campaign that was um, uh, that that wanted to um, step out of the European Union, the UK that wanted to step out of the, the European Union, uh, cultivated a, a nationalist, nostalgic return to to empire based on an anti-immigration um, agenda, a racist agenda. Uh, on the other hand, we have the Remain campaign that seems very neutral and reasonable, but it is very strongly tied to uh, a eurocratic financial austerity elite that has depleted countries like Italy, Portugal, uh, Greece. Um, and new unions developed as a response to, to this dichotomy, asking the question, what would be third, fourth, fifth, sixth scenarios that identify this, uh, this, this dualism, these two options for the future of the European Union, as equally wrong? Um, so what would be a feminist union? What would be an ecological union? What would be a transcontinental union? Isn't the union the most interesting aspect of um, Europe rather than this um, partially fictional uh, cultural uh, category uh, through which we describe the continent? So in front of you, you, you see a, a map. This is the uh, fourth version of the map um, that, uh, that, that depicts, that visualizes all progressive transnational political parties that are active in the European continent at large today. It shows a, a map that is not uh, defined by boundaries, but the, it's a map that is defined by these organizations themselves. They are the, the orienting points to navigate this, this map, this inverted map, this, this map that looks at the world from uh, upside down, from inside out also challenging the way that we have been uh, approaching uh, geographical uh, territories that we have been depicting, mapping, um, uh, controlling geographical uh, uh, territories up until the day of, uh, of today. It's, it's a map that challenges the very idea of what a map is or could be. And it asks a viewer, it asks a potential member of our campaign to start thinking of how um, a union between these particular political parties could lead to alternative 
uh, forms of transnational unionization, that it could lead to this uh, alternative scenarios from stateless unions to communal unions. Essentially, new unions in that sense is a campaign uh, for the imagination. It's a campaign for the imagination that tries to fight uh, fictional false dualisms and uh, dichotomies that keep our present hostage in order to enable the possibility of an emancipated future. The term populism, of course, is a little bit difficult because there are different different readings. There are some that say populism is always tied to the right wing. There are people like Ernesto Laclau who argued that left forms of <clears throat> populism also exist, that, that, that it relates to the popular. Um, in that sense, maybe it's easiest to make the kind of distinction between um, popular and populists, popular in terms of uh, for and by the people, populist as being extremely reductive in who the people is and who who does not belong to that to that category. Who is human enough to be part of the people? Who is uh, inhuman because of um, uh, migration background, color of skin, religious uh, orientation, whatever, to not 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 be included into that uh, into that category? I think us versus them di dichotomy is very similar to um, the leave remain dichotomy of the Brexit um, referendum. They are also, they result from, 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 stories, from stories that we tell, from, from common narratives that we initiate. And what is, what for me, art and culture is the field of myth-making, of storytelling, of um, building uh, imaginaries and, and um, um, morphologies that that uh, help us interpret or reinterpret or recompose the world that we live in, our past, but also our potential futures. So, in a way, there's 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 always this artistic, cultural, almost literary element to to, to politics because it relates to because it relates to narrative, and narrative is a core component of any propagation of, uh, of of the world we exist in or the world that we want to that we want to create so yes i think that that art politically engaged art has a, has a huge role to play in rethinking the narratives based on which we orient ourselves on the world to challenge notions myth myths and narratives like the ones that are focused on notions of private property uh, or the identity politics of the authoritarian right, the, the, the myth of white ind indigeneity, to deconstruct those, but also to tell new and different stories about planetary commons, about planetary unionization, about transnational parliaments, about utopian training camps, about experimental biospheres, to think the infrastructures and stories with which we world the world in, in a different way. Tough question. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a big ask for art to do. Um, I um, I think that uh, the arts in general, and I guess kind of cultural expression um, made into different forms, uh, uh, can of course um, provide all sorts of compelling and moving cultural uh, cues for people to invest in. And I think. Uh, you know, I guess as a consumer myself and a, as a as a lover of art, fine art, but also music. So there's lots of things to look at which aren't, um, I guess, about um, polarizing us them. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, certainly this work that I'm showing you uh, in Impact at the moment is about that. So my work in this case is definitely not something that does that. It, it maybe even um, identifies and kind of uh, articulates some of what's problematic about divisive um, stories which don't include um, many visions of the world. It definitely can uh, formulate alternatives. Um, the problem with these is that, um, like, unfortunately, I, I, I have the feeling that the art is just simply not powerful enough. It doesn't have um, uh, the tools to uh, to have a stronger impact on, let's say, wider public. Um, and for that reason, actually, anything formulated by 
uh, by by any art uh, product um, um, with this kind of let's say uh, <clears throat> uh, counter ideolo ideological content or whatever they just um, they just cannot reach the the level of the um, political propaganda which is for sure it might be differing in different countries in Hungary it is very strong uh, generally speaking I have the feeling that uh, the art um, uh, can can generate a significant change in a society, mostly through its, let's say, pedagogic um, sort of effect or, or uh, through its pedagogic function. Um, but uh, it can uh, express or it can generate real changes only in, in certain situations. So when the things starts to already move to, 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 to transform, and uh, in, in that moment, if the art interferes with, for sure, not with, uh, uh, let's say, traditional forms, but rather untraditional forms like artistic activism or whatever, it can make a lot of difference. But if there is nothing, if the people are passive, if the, the whole kind of uh, political discourse is like uh, held by the power and there is no choice uh, <clears throat> of an alternative voice, the art can do uh, much less, I believe. It's much, much less, uh, less powerful. Yeah, I think art can. I think art can also not. I mean, there is art is not. Uh, yeah, art is not um, only good or bad. Uh, art can. Uh, but I do think that in art there is an experimental tradition and there is a curiosity that makes people want to explore new ways of, of being or futures or possibility for futures and, uh, and there is a long tradition of doing that so maybe there is a... Uh, we could say that there is a hope that that can be possible there. I believe that art can be helpful in presenting emotions in a multi-layered way and not oversimplifying, not oversimplifying them. But I think it needs to like create this intersectional front with the other spheres of activism or with civic movement. A human rights movement and I don't think it will be able to do anything alone I think art is, art in a, art is not enough unfortunately for me I would love to do that art but I think that it can be a part and it can be important part in this movement of, of many different people um, but it, ne it needs to be not too egoistic in this, to be a part of it, I think. <laughs>